Uh, welcome back. I know we got some folks uh, still out there making their way back, but uh, I appreciate those of you who did uh, come back in here for this next speaker. <clears throat> Very excited about this one. Um, earlier this year, when Eugene Cashper stood on a stage, uh, I guess a little bit similar to this, in front of uh, all of his beer distributors, um, and he described Pabst, which is the, the fifth largest beer company in the U.S. by volume, as a small upstart underdog brewer. Uh, I knew at that moment that I had to get him to sit down and chat with me here at the Brewbound session. Um, I, I wrote it earlier this year, and, and I'll repeat it today. Underdog brewers don't typically sell about six million barrels of beer annually, and they don't usually have about 500 employees. Um, underdog brewers don't have dedicated national chain teams, PR firms. Uh, they don't have the resources of the distributor network or the financial wherewithal to take an unknown alcoholic root beer and turn it into a $100 million overnight success. And uh, I know that most underdog brewers typically don't have <coughs> anyone in their organization that they refer to as the 7-Eleven guy. Um, so uh, <laughs> that is exactly uh, how Eugene is approaching his business, though, as an underdog. Um, and you know, despite the advantages that Pabst may have over you know, 5,000 smaller craft brewers, uh, companies like Heineken and Constellation and, and AB and Miller Coors still have significant market advantages over Pabst. And Eugene, like many of the entrepreneurs here today, recognizes just how quickly the U.S. beer landscape is changing. And he's not the type of guy to sit back and, and watch companies pass a 172-year-old Pabst Brewing Company by. Um, in 2014, uh, just a little background on Eugene, in 2014, uh, he and private equity firm TSG Consumer, Consumer Partners uh, purchased Pabst for about $750 million. Um, and it, it's significant because uh, that, was a, that was a big deal in 2014. And what he's done with the business since, um, and what he's doing, uh, obviously, with uh, yesterday's news by hiring Simon Thorpe, the, the former CEO of Duval Morcott, um, is, is very interesting. And uh, I invited him here today in part because I wanted to give him a chance to explain why he views Pabst as an underdog, but also to have him share his thoughts on the category evolution and to discuss his company's partnership strategy within Kraft. So uh, without further ado, I will bring Mr. Eugene Cashper to the stage with a big round of applause, I hope. Thanks a lot, Chris. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We can have a seat. Yeah. Pick, pick a chair. Yeah, yeah this bite. looks good. <laughs> this, this thing. So um, <coughs> now, that, like, now that the cat's out of the bag, I guess, yesterday with the, uh, the announcement, um, I, you know, I'd, I'd sort of initially planned to kick this thing off with a, you know, what's the latest with Pabst, but uh, um, you fired Simon Thorpe as, as the new CEO. Can you tell me how that relationship unfolded and what drove your decision to, to bring someone like Simon uh, onto the Pabst team? Yeah, I mean, uh, from the point in time when I was even thinking about getting involved with Pabst um, uh, during the sale process two and a half years ago, you know, I felt that uh, the ideal scenario would be, you know, for me to be in a full-time chairman role, and for a, a business this complex, uh, I think it is very important uh, to have the CEO and chairman role split. Uh, at that time, though, uh, I kind of took, there wasn't uh, someone that I had a great uh, personal relationship with that might have been the right partner to do that with at that time. Um, and I think I've learned a lot, you know, being involved hands-on uh, in the day-to-day -day myself for these two years uh, and had a chance to work on uh, really building our team and building our culture. Uh, but throughout the process, I've always thought about, uh, you know, how do I find kind of the right partner to, to really take PAPS to, to the next level? Because there is so much complexity uh, and our ambitions are significant. Um, so I think there's plenty of work both for a CEO and a chairman. And so when Simon uh, became available, I had met him, talked to him, and, and felt that he you know, really stood out uh, in the sense that uh, he, he is somewhat of, a, of, a, of an industry visionary where I think he really gets it. 
um, and he's also uh, uh, ha also has a, a really strong marketing background, uh, having done some CMO roles, worked in other categories, uh, maybe 20 years or so ago before he really dedicated himself to beer. Uh, and I think uh, he can really help us uh, in many areas. Uh, so, uh, you know, we got to talking and just felt like this was right. And I found out yesterday when we actually announced the deal that his birthday is the same day as mine. Oh, geez. So uh, <laughs> I knew then this is the right path for yeah, us. If, if that isn't a sign, right? Um, so, you know, it, it sounds like a lot of what Simon is going to be tasked with accomplishing is, is really kind of uh, fine-tuning and focusing in on this partnership strategy that you guys are developing um, and that you've you know, you've, you've executed a few of these partners, partnerships um, with Vermont Hard Cider and, and uh, with Small Town, but it, it sounds like Simon's going to be at least partly responsible for accelerating that. Um, well, I would say, uh, look, first, strategically, our number one priority is to take advantage of our heritage brand portfolio. You know, no one has a portfo portfolio of brands like that, so it starts with Pabst, PBR, and then some of our local legends. Lone Star, Rainier, uh, and we think that, that is, that's what makes our company go. That's the base of our business where we're playing in, uh, let's call those the, the more mass segments, right? And, and we think uh, those brands, because of the authenticity they have, the stories they have, and the simplicity, they're kind of at an intersection between craft and mainstream beer um, that puts us, uh, we believe, in, in a sweet spot if we do the right things. Uh, with those brands. Uh, and, and so that's what's going to make or break our business. But I think when we innovate with those brands and make a better beer, you know, we think we should be doing that at a very affordable price level. So there's no question that the industry is already 40% high end. It's going to be, you know, 50, 60% high end most likely. Um, so uh, as a major beer supplier, even though we only have, you know, a two share, uh, we want to be part of that. Uh, and we want to participate in those segments. And so I would say we, we need to take advantage of our heritage brands, and then we need to build a platform. And we, we use the term platform to kind of encompass the things that we do, uh, which is getting the beer made, getting the beer sold, and all the things that go along with that, right? The network development, the business insights, uh, the, log the logistics, and everything else. Um, we want to develop a platform that can be really nimble and powerful where you know, we can partner with brand owners in the high-end space um, and, and help them maximize the potential of their brands. Um, so I think uh, we certainly do expect uh, to do some things you know, in, in the craft beer space and to find the right partners. Uh, but it really starts with making sure that you know, our heritage brands are on a good footing and that our platform is working the right way. So why are you bullish on, your, on PAP's ability to go after sort of that intersect, the intersection that you mentioned between sort of mainstream and craft with some of your local, local heritage brands? Well, first of all, they have these deep local stories, but then they also have the simplicity in terms of drinkable beer uh, and a very simple story. I think that right now we're getting to a stage where some of what Kraft is offering is becoming a bit overwhelming and complex for people. So I think you know, we're able to cut through that and to, and to offer uh, a really affordable price point. Um, and I think there's also a very good synergy with our brands and Kraft, right? The, the, the PBR consumer has by far a higher index to Kraft than you know, a Bud Miller Coors consumer. Uh, and we're, you know, we're successful in uh, geographies where craft is big and our occasions are kind of revolve around craft. Uh, uh, you know, having a Rainier or a Lone Star is something people do. They don't want the big corporate brand. Um, and those are the same people who are drinking craft, but they may not want to have, you know, five or six craft beers because it's expensive and maybe a little heavy. Um, so we're part of that set for them. Um, so it's a really nice fit. And yet there's still a desire to get into the craft space uh, through some partnerships. What, how will those unfold? What will those look like? Yeah, so I think we, we have, uh, uh, we want to pursue quite a different strategy uh, than uh, some of the major brewers uh, because we don't really believe that if we just roll a craft brand into Pabst, 
that that is long term a sustainable approach. You know, we think craft is all about the passion and the innovation um, uh, of the people who created those brands and uh, a, a dedicated organization, a real uh, brewery, and, and it has to be real. You can't, I, don't think, I don't think you can fake it. So what we're looking for are people who don't want to sell. You know, I, I think... Are there I, a lot of those people? I Seems think like there are. Seems like there's a lot of people I who want to sell right now. Well, I, I think that uh, it's, the market is getting really, really difficult, right? So that's driving people to consider all their options. Um, people are getting squeezed from all sides. You've got all these big guys with national uh, sort of punching power, and then you've got all these little guys nipping at you, and, and you know, where are you if you're not one of those handful of brands uh, yeah. that has already been established at a national basis? Um, but I think that many of the people in craft, uh, they, care, they care about lifestyle, they care about legacy, and I think, yes, they also care about liquidity, but uh, I believe that in the right partnership, you know, we can offer that uh, for people, and, and there are a lot of them out there, and it's all about just like, you talk about the fit with Simon, I mean, we're in the beer business, we're an independent brewer, we're here to have fun, enjoy the people we work with, yeah. you know, uh, it's not all about dollars and cents. So I think it's just uh, finding the right relationship and, and the right way to execute that partnership. And what, what I mean by partnership is that, you know, we wouldn't own the brewer. We feel if we own it, it it's not just a, a BA definition. It's not really craft anymore uh, in the emotional sense. Hmm. You know what I mean? So, so I think what we want to do is be a facilitator uh, we think that uh, people who've created these brands and who get the DNA of their brands um, uh, and who've created their own culture in that organization, their best place to create the magic, right, the romance, the excitement that you have to have if you want to grow sustainably for the long term. And we might be best placed to make sure uh, beer can be made to spec and efficiently, proper service levels to customers, you know, having things like chain teams and business insight teams and, and, and uh, logistics setups that allow you to uh, get everything to your consumers uh, on time. So I think that, you know, that can be a, a really good partnership. And, and if we own the brewer, I'm not saying we wouldn't consider something, but I don't think that's the, the right path for us. So are you talking more about a, a, like a straight up partnership arrangement? Or are you talking about minority stakes? Uh, I, I'm really talking about an arm's length arrangement, right? Like similar to what we have uh, when it comes to the woodchuck cider business or for instance, we have an arm's length relationship with Qingdao. You know, they, they own their brand. Uh, probably I'm uh, talking about something that's even, uh, even more of an equitable partnership where the, the craft brewer brand owner is someone, uh, you know, we believe can really uh, do a great job with their brand by utilizing the resources we have and their own knowledge and capabilities. So, uh, you know, controlling what happens with the brand, controlling what happens with the innovation, uh, maybe controlling, you know, brand ambassadors that are all around the country that kind of live and represent the, the, the brand or the brewery. Um, and us doing the execution, uh, both on the supply chain side and the sales side, and maybe, you know, having some of our uh, resources uh, on the marketing side, whether it be some expertise on, you know, social media or trade marketing programs where, you know, we can do some consulting and help them out. But really, I think that uh, once we take the brand in and it's just one of our brands, you know, five years down the road, is that going to be the kind of vibrant craft brand that's going to compete successfully with all the passionate real craft owners? You know, that sounds like a tough sell to me. So uh, then what's in it for PAPS? I mean, it sounds like you're going to do a, a ton of work, not take an equity, you know, well, in some cases not take an equity position. Um, you know, what do you get out of it other than well, well, so, so, uh, distribution, look, I, I mean, suppose? We, our job is to serve our customers, right? That's distributors, retailers, and consumers. We're currently selling mostly below premium beer, or what we call it, near premium or below premium, where... Uh, you know, the margins are a couple bucks a case. Right. So when there are craft brewers out there, uh, you know, that are independent, uh, they're, they're in a setup where, I don't know, maybe they're making a margin of eight, 10, a gross margin of eight, $10 a case, and they're making 
you know, they can make four or five dollars a case. You know, with the synergies that exist, the idea is that we can help them get to, you know, fifteen dollar a case gross margin and much, much bigger sales volumes. And so there's plenty to go around where, you know, the goal is for, uh, you know, the craft brewer uh, to make, you know, whatever, depending on how established they are, but to make several times what they would have made without us and for us to be profitable as well and uh, to be able to offer, you know, our customers, uh, you know, what they're looking for. Sometimes they're looking for a PBR and sometimes they're looking for a really interesting craft beer. Yeah, there, there's a lot of moving pieces um, with this strategy, particularly with regards to production. Pabst obviously doesn't own any breweries uh, of significant scale. I mean, I know you guys are doing a tap room and, and small innovation yeah. site, um, but you know, really beyond that, it's all contract relationships. Um, your biggest relationship being with Miller Coors, and, and there's some turmoil there, obviously. Um, so when you talk about bringing a craft brewer, you know, into the PAP supply chain and, and these things that you can offer a company, h how do you, yeah, you know, well, reconcile I, the, the production Well, issue? I would say, look, the, it all starts with the beer. So most craft brewers, they have a, a brewery where they brew the beer. Um, there are a lot of other aspects of supply chain, uh, you know, purchasing and customer service and logistics and, uh, you know, being able to, uh, a, a lot of it is about being able to do the special releases well, small SKUs. Uh, so uh, all those things, I think we can add a lot of value in. And then if there are brands or a brand that it makes sense to scale at a different level, you know, instead of like a lot of craft brewers today have gone out and borrowed, I don't know, 20, 30 million dollars, build a couple hundred thousand barrel facility, um, and it becomes a very difficult situation. Yep. Uh, I think that uh, even without owning facilities, the con contract relationships we have, where we have uh, a brewing team that's there to make sure beer will be get made uh, the right way, uh, and we have, uh, again, a supply chain organization that manages that effort and long-term contracts in place uh, that, that makes sure that you know, we, we get beer made uh, uh, to, to quality and, and efficiently, I think that all has a lot of value for people, and we can still do that um, you know, achieve a much more efficient result than people can on a standalone basis. Sure. Um, so are you having active conversations with craft brewers now? Yeah, and we, we over these two years, I mean, we've had uh, plenty of conversations. I think what, uh, part of where we probably were not taking the right approach is that largely we were reacting to uh, people who were sending us stuff who had decided that, well, we want to get out or maybe with, a, with an earn out for a few years, but really, you know, we want to sell this business. And so, uh, you know, we're uh, having some of those discussions, but the more we had those discussions, we figured out that's not the right fit for us. Um, so uh, I, I think now we're being a little bit more proactive in saying uh, what is the ideal situation, the ideal partner, where there are the right synergies, you know, for our platform. Um, and for them as well, um, and, and uh, you know, trying to be proactive to have these conversations, build these relationships, because in the end, you know, the goal is to work together for many, many years. So uh, it's not something that is you know, a six-month auction process. It's building a relationship. Um, maybe there's a conversation, there's some conversations that happen over the course of a year, two, three. And certainly Simon has had that kind of experience, I think, for the past seven, eight years, talking to lots of people. And uh, we're on the same page in terms of, you know, trying to find the best fit uh, so that, you know, we, we, we can build uh, the right portfolio over the next five, ten years. You said that some of these conversations uh, just, you know, for whatever reason didn't feel right or the fit wasn't there um, or you decided eventually that that wasn't the direction you wanted to go in. Um, what was it specifically that you guys pinpointed well, I, about those businesses right. that made it such that you didn't want to, you know, go down that well, path? Well, I would also add that we, we wanted to be ready, and we weren't totally ready. Yet. Okay. You know, so a lot has happened in these two years where, uh, you know, we've vastly expanded our organization. We have done some partnerships. They haven't been in classic craft beer, but Small Down, Qingdao, Cider, 
doing some, a charitable project with Dogtag Brewing Company. So we, we have been doing some things, and for our platform to integrate, integrate those successfully and to be ready uh, uh, for us to, you know, to talk to a craft brewer and to say, hey, we're going to be able to do X, Y, and Z, you know, we need to be certain of that. We don't want to screw that up. So I think that that's been another factor is we, we've had a lot going on. Our business has been growing, and uh, uh, we didn't want to rush into something. Um, but sorry, your question. I kind uh, of, well, you know, was there yeah. anything specific about those businesses oh, yeah. that you identified as um, potentially problematic, you know, w within those respective right. organizations that kind of threw up a red flag for you? Right. Uh, well, I think uh, certainly there, there, there are situations in which we might feel that we can't add a lot of value because of what's been done already, maybe in terms of the distribution footprint, and maybe we're concerned about the brand. Um, there, are, there are also situations where you know, we're concerned about the potential partner and whether you know, that fit can work and whether they can uh, uh, really own their brand and grow it in the context of a, of a partnership with us. Um, and then you know, synergies uh, for our platform to make sure that you know, what we're doing makes sense, that it, you know, it, 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 there is a logic and it enhances our platform capabilities and we're playing to our strengths you know, rather than our weaknesses, both you know, geographically, channel-wise. Um, and when, when we look at craft brewers today, certainly uh, we believe those national ambitions, you know, very few uh, participants can really have those. Yep. So either it's some sort of ownership of a style that's out there, uh, or uh, there, there is a real lifestyle brand platform. Um, and that's, that can become a different kind of business. You know, uh, uh, maybe there, there's, there's less of a, of a craft aspect then because that can just morph into what I would call the premium of tomorrow, right? There are some brands, uh, you know, like a Kona that is playing in that space. Um, uh, so, so I think uh, evaluating all those factors and, and you know, m making sure we really believe that in 10 years this is still going to be growing. Yeah. So you talked about the, the national opportunity for some of these brands. Um, how many craft brands do you feel are actually scalable and in your eyes will you know, sort of vie for that national set? Yeah, I mean, n not a lot. So I think that's why we've also kind of updated our strategy to say, uh, you know, there are some specific geographies where there might be a good synergy with what we're doing and where we have some capabilities. Um, and, uh, you know, there could be a, a, the right sort of local brand fit um, and, and uh, uh, with some potential to become regional instead of local. Um, I, I, I think, you know, 10, 15 national brands, uh, I think, is a, is a reasonable number when you don't, uh, before touching kind of each uh, style. So, you know, maybe there'll be a stout brand and, and uh, a sour brand eventually that kind of has a leading position in, in, in some of these more niche styles. Um, but other than that, uh, I think 1015 is probably uh, more than uh, both the, the supplier and distributor network and, and the, the retail network are going to be able to handle because there is so, so much space that's necessary for local. Yeah. Yeah, and, and um, you know, you talk about the, the distributor networks um, and the retailers as well. You know, a lot of those folks are actually kind of pulling back a bit on the amount of SKUs they're keeping in their warehouse or on their, on their shelves, looking, you know, more towards velocity. Uh, and, you know, out-of-stocks are an issue for a lot of brands, so they right. found that if they've over skewed their set and <laughs> they've only got a couple six packs in the store, it doesn't do anybody any good to have an empty spot on the shelf. Um, how do you see all that kind of shaking yeah, out over the I next? I mean, that, that plays to you know, what we can offer, meaning uh, uh, we can get some share of mind. A distributor has what are 50, 70 suppliers, right? So as one of their kind of three or four biggest suppliers, um, uh, you know, we, we do have a chance to get their attention and make sure uh, that, the, that a brand get, gets what it deserves. And it's the same story uh, with some of the big chains where you know, we have an organization, we have uh, a, you know, a team for Walmart or a team for 7-Eleven. You have a 7-Eleven guy. 
We have more than one 7-Eleven guy. Well, so. there was one guy that introduced himself to me as the 7-Eleven oh, guy. Oh, really? Yeah. So. He's probably the head of that team. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, that does play to our strength as, as uh, Kraft certainly has been probably overskewed if you just look at the metrics. Um, and so as you see people consolidating that and becoming a lot more diligent about uh, uh, complexity costing and analyzing their profitability, both the retailers and the distributors, um, you know, they, they need suppliers uh, who have a, a, a range of things and who can offer them the kind of service they need, which means that, you know, they're getting a truck every second day with a big mix of things and they only have what they need, you know, on the floor. Yeah. Um, so when we, when we spoke, I think last week or the week before, um, you know, to kind of talk about some of this stuff, um, and, and getting back to some of these, uh, these partner questions, you said that you wanted to identify partners that um, can create magic and excitement for Pabst. Um, wh what for, is for that? their brands, for their brands. Oh, okay, for yeah, their brands. For their brands, yeah. Um, you know, and, and you, you obviously touched on it. You haven't ruled out taking an equity position. Um, and then you said something interesting about uh, being able to allow these brands to uh, achieve liquidity, but maybe through a third party. Um, how yeah, would you so see that kind of playing out if Pabst is sort of a master distributor and, you know, maybe they're actually, you know, offering some equity to somebody else? How does that work? Yeah, I, so, so uh, when I talk about those three topics, uh, I think lifestyle is important for people. They enjoy what they do. They love it. Um, and so controlling their brand, doing the creative work of building their brand and creating that magic is what they love to do. And, and so what we want to be is the facilitator that takes all the stuff that is more of a headache and they're not that well set up to, to, uh, to do competitively. Um, so I think uh, that's the lifestyle piece is really making sure that the people who are creating these brands and building these brands can, can do what they do best. Um, and uh, when we talk about liquidity, uh, first it's helping to really grow their business and make it more profitable and the, you know, vastly improve the cash flow situation so that if today they're thinking, you know, how do I meet these working capital needs? How do I meet these CapEx needs? Uh, you, you know, all of a sudden in a partnership with us, you know, there should be a lot of free cash to pay like significant dividends for people. And then the other aspect is probably that if there is the right kind of long-term deal with us and uh, it, it, people see that it is working or, it, or it, uh, it's going to work, whether it's, you know, family office money or, 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 or whatever, if people want to sell a, mi you know, monetize a minority stake um, so they can take some cash off the table in addition to paying healthier dividends, you know, I, I wouldn't see why that would be a problem as long as the partner we're working with, you know, is still in control and that's who we're dealing with as opposed to someone who, you know, has a drag along right and can sell this tomorrow and it becomes a, a, a complicated situation. I think it, it's also, uh, you know, that, that other L, that, that word that I used is legacy. So it, it really depends. If people have a five-year vision, you know, they may not really care about that so much. But if they have a 20, 30-year vision, uh, potentially even a next generational vision, um, you know, that's important for them and they want to get into, uh, you know, the kind of relationship that uh, facilitates them building that rather than, uh, you know, borrowing a lot of money and, fighting it out and probably having to sell soon enough. Yeah. Yeah, and it seems like there have been a lot of companies who have gone out and borrowed a lot of money. Um, in sort of your travels and your conversations with folks, um, what are you recognizing as some of the biggest pain points for these companies that have, you know, gone out and embarked on these large expansions and you know, maybe... Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a big problem because there's, you know, there's been so much cheap money, right, in our country in general. and. Craft has been at the epicenter of what's hot and our, you know, bubble to some extent, right? Uh, whether it be valuations or, you know, people willing to lend on really attractive terms. But, uh, yeah, I think the problem is with the competition that you have in the industry, you know, you go out and build. Um, and then if you can't sell all that profit profitably, I think we're going to have so many two, 300,000 barrel breweries with excess capacity where, you know, pricing is going to come down and it's going to be difficult. I, I think we've been through, you know, a fantastic cycle the last five, six years. And uh, inevitably, there's going to be this more difficult cycle. I think a lot of people are feeling it already. 
and they really have no choice but to get out. Hmm. So where does PAPS fit into all that? Will you look to maybe take over some of that capacity at some point? Okay, I mean, I mean uh, you know, we're not like thinking uh, on, um, you know, so ambitiously uh, about it. I think what we uh, would look to is, uh, is, you know, forge the right partnerships and, you know, one at a time um, uh, in order to build the right portfolio of, of uh, brands uh, or, or, or breweries as partners who, you know, don't compete with each other, who are complementary, um, and, uh, you know, with whom we'll really enjoy working and, and believe that we can grow for the long term. And, of course, um, uh, the fact that there is more and more capacity out there uh, that's available, um, uh, you know, that works for our kind of more nimble, flexible model of, uh, you know, doing some contract production uh, in different geographies uh, to fit some of the different local legends we have and so on. Um, but I wouldn't certainly rule out, you know, in the future us, you know, owning uh, some significant brewing assets. That's something we, you know, we're always considering and looking at and, and Well, and you, you have know. the option for the, the Woodenville Brewery, the CBA Brewery. Right. How's that moving forward? Are you guys looking seriously at that, or? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we, we, we look, we look seriously <laughs> at everything, but the option has, you know, a couple more years to run. So I think uh, we have to think through uh, our priorities, um, and and uh, uh, you know, make those make those decisions. Yeah. Um, long term for Pabst. Uh, when you start to kind of look at the entire picture, um, you've got a CEO in place now uh, who has, you know, over the years demonstrated, you know, a, a, a great ability to go out and forge relationships and partnerships with craft breweries, execute behind, you know, very specific strategies, um, and, you know, set companies up for long-term success. You've got a vast portfolio of heritage and, and local legends brands. You're looking to, uh, you know, create more of these craft partnerships. Long term, um, what's, what's the goal for Pabst? Um, you've got TSG as a partner. I'm sure they have, you know, some sort of uh, life cycle as well with their investment. Um, yeah, I mean, where do you see it all heading? Uh, well, you know, I personally, you know, want to continue for the very long term with this business. I see it as, you know, a strategic business. Um, so I think that um, TSG is, is a great partner for us in that they're aligned with a real growth strategy, you know, unlike maybe a lot of private equity firms who are looking to find ways to cut costs and uh, integrate some things and, 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 and find some synergies there. And I think they have a history of, you know, partnering with owners um, and doing that for a significant period of time and then potentially, you know, getting bought out by the owners or through a recap or through an IPO, uh, you know, or, or, or some, some other process like that. But I think we're still far away from, you know, that discussion because uh, I think, you know, the, the, the project is going well and when something is going well, um, I think everybody's happy and, and um, you know, we believe that's going to be the case for, for many years. Yeah. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and um, <clears throat> just talk kind of broadly about some of the industry issues. Um, certainly there's, I mean, there's so much stuff happening uh, with Mega Brew and, you know, the DOJ um, and, and some of their provisions that they've put or placed on uh, Anheuser-Busch going forward. Um, you know, do, do you feel that uh, it was enough, uh, that the provisions that they yeah, it, put on them was enough? Or? It, honestly, it, it, it's shocking to me that for some reason in the United States, we do not have regulation these days. Um, so, I mean, in the rest of the world, you know, if you have a 40 share, I mean, you don't, you don't get to buy stuff and uh, you don't get to uh, circumvent uh, uh, antitrust, whether it be... Uh, uh, r related to uh, other players in the industry and tying them up or uh, doing something uh, with distributors. Uh, you know, there's no enforcement when we talk about venues and stadiums. Um, you know, for some reason, uh, I think our Department of Justice just doesn't want to deal with it, um, which is, you know, I think strange to me. And uh, I believe that ABI has been quite successful um, in in their interactions, 
uh, and they're, I think, emboldened, and, and probably Miller Coors as well, um, uh, you know, to, to do more things and to try to cement, you know, their duopoly on beer production in the United States. Uh, you know, there'll, be, there'll always be tap rooms and little local breweries, but as far as that uh, national shelf and, you know, their share of the profit pool, um, you know, is an astronomical number, right. and then you add in Constellation in the import space. So uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, their goal is for, for the beer industry to be one where people can do a tap room or a nanobrewery or something like that, microbrewery, and, and, and a person can make a living. But as far as the rest of the pie, um, they've been put in a position where they can try to uh, really box everyone else out. And you know we'll see if that changes because it wouldn't be flying in other markets. And and you don't think the DOJ is doing enough then? I mean they've, you know, they've they've written in the ability to <coughs> review any of their deals. Um, they've certainly, you know, attempted to uh, make sense of the distribution piece and um, you know restrict what they can and can't do with regards to distribution. Um, yeah, I mean I I, I, would, I don't, wouldn't go too deep, but I think that. Uh, they're kind of focused very short term, and they think that if something is not going to result in prices in the industry going up tomorrow, then you know they have other things to do, and they shouldn't really waste time um, with competitive issues. Uh, and so maybe it's the AGs, the state AGs, that uh, maybe would become more active going forward. Um, but I, 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 you know, I'm surprised at how it's developed so far. And I think it's just because we haven't gotten to the stage yet where uh, you know, the other industry participants are really feeling <laughs> what they're doing. But we'll get there. Interesting. Um, what else about the way the space is evolving right now um, keeps you up at night or makes you scratch your head and um, you know, gives you, you know, what, what concerns do you have about just kind of the way things are evolving and, and how quickly they're evolving? in the industry. Well, I think the pace of change is, you know, it only accelerates and that creates opportunity, you know, for the smaller guys who, are, uh, who can be more nimble and who can do some new things. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't see a problem there. I, I think that the antitrust issues, you know, are, are, are really a big problem. And, you know, for instance, when you look at like Yingling's arguments and, you know, I, I, I uh, fully sympathize with that situation. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what happens. Yeah. So there's there's nothing else beyond the DOJ stuff that that is really s troubling to you. Um, what about some of these, um, you know, the 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 conversations that we've heard about uh, too much choice and um, you know. Yeah, I, I I think that beer, you know, it lost so much share of throat to wine and spirits, you know, over a 20, 30 year period. That uh, that's our big opportunity as an industry. Um, so whether it's uh, some winification of craft or its flavor in FMBs. Um, I, I think that we have uh, really big opportunities to grow share, and, and, and I, I, don't, uh, I don't see any problems there. Yeah. You know? um, I think when we spoke last week, you also mentioned um, this idea that the you know, the amount of uh, available capacity would lead to some pricing concerns um, and, and, you know, some aggressive pricing programs. Um, does that scare you at all? And well, for, for where us, does that again, leave we're, we're, Because yeah. you're going to be right in the middle of it with, with so many of your, your well, brands. Well, I, I would say, you know, I think we're talking about craft pricing and we're seeing it really come down. Um, I think you're seeing people be more and more aggressive. Um, well, that's going to creep right into your space where a lot of those heritage brands are. Well, I mean, we're, our price point, you know, we're, 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 we're selling PBR for 16 bucks a case retail. So Kraft is at, you know, 32 to 60 bucks a case retail. So, sure. uh, you know, uh, that's a whole different world. Um, and uh, I'm thinking more of some know. of the, you know, the Rainier Mountain Pale Ales and, and, and some of those projects. Well, with, th with those things, I mean, I think what we can offer is when we you know, make a Strobohemian or an old style Oktoberfest, uh, or even if one day we do something with Pabst, um, you know, bring something back pre-prohibition um, that's a more flavorful beer. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we should be kind of at a, you know, Bud Miller Coors sort of premium price or just above that. 
Um, so we can offer that affordability. Uh, we're not looking to, again, we don't think it's credible for us to, uh, even if we make a fantastic beer, uh, uh, to, to position ourselves with a Lone Star or, or some of the other brands that we have and, and say that we're a craft beer and, and people should pay, you know, 40 bucks a case for it. So I don't think there's any, you know, there's any conflict there. And in, in the space that we play, uh, I think we, ha we have the affordable brands that have brand value. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of our competitors, brands who are affordable, you know, if you talk about the below premium space, they're purely commoditized. And I think with what the big brewers are doing in the premium space, you know, those brands are becoming fully commoditized as well. Yep. I must, mean, must they've been honest. diluted all the way out with loads and loads of uh, line extensions and, um, uh, you know, the, the way they're treating them, that's the economy of tomorrow. And I think the consumer feels that. And that's a big, uh, a big challenge for them and a big opportunity for us. Hmm. What, what's uh, Beyond Craft? And, um, you know, obviously you guys got into that hard soda segment. Uh, are there any other, you know, creative areas for growth that, that you've, that you've I think identified? For us, imports are also uh, an area where um, uh, we can do some things where, again, I mean, the import uh, business hasn't changed in forever, really. The import business in the United States? Yeah, I mean, it's been pretty much a constant. Uh, I mean, well, it's changed in the. If you look at Constellation and what their business is, where their business is today, and where it was, you know, some years ago. Sure, sure. Um, the, the companies uh, within the space have have certainly evolved, but uh, just the import segment in general has been, um, you know, it, it's. It hasn't really evolved as, as quickly as some of the other segments in, in, mm. in beer have. Well, I mean, I, I guess, again, the way we look at the growth has been very, very healthy in imports, and they're offering that kind of simplicity that is an alternative to craft. Yep. Um, uh, and so I think there are big opportunities there, uh, you know, n not only for, uh, uh, you know, the Mexican brands, but also for some of the brands from the rest of the world. Um, I think that uh, there is a chance for us to play in that. In the, in the Mexican space? No, I mean, well... Or just uh, in general? I think in general. In, in, in imports in general, um, if there are, you know, st strong brands with a deep heritage, a good story, product story, brand story, uh, it's clear, it's simple, it's drinkable, um, I think, you know, consumers appreciate that. Hmm. And I think we're coming out of a cycle where, you know, people were obsessed with, you know, what's new and innovation. I think our, our sales director tells of an actual situation where, you know, you're standing in an outlet, a couple guys walk in and, you know, they're looking at the shelf and one asks uh, the other, hey, have you, have you heard of that beer? Uh, how about this one? He's like, oh yeah, I tried that last week. It was the best beer I've ever tasted. It's like, okay, well, let's get a six pack of that. No, 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 I want something new, <laughs> you know? So I think that's, we're, we're in that uh, extreme uh, situation and I think we're going to gradually come out of it, you know, because... People have been just so obsessed with choice. We're seeing what's happening with seasonals. Um, so I, I think there will be an element of back to basics. Yeah, yeah, the pendulum definitely starting to swing back the other way, it seems. Um, and clearly, I mean, you know, from our conversation uh, earlier and, and yesterday with Simon, it sounds like there's this real opportunity at that intersection that you, that you spoke about. Um, and that's, it seems like where the pendulum is swinging. Uh, hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> um, well, you know, we got one question here from the audience, um, and it, it's an interesting one, and, you know, I don't know how this will all shake out, but uh, the question is, you know, given the statistics <coughs> that, we've, that we heard earlier this morning, um, have you ever considered moving into the cannabis in industry <laughs> with a <laughs> beverage? Oh, with a beverage. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, I, I'm sure that... Uh, uh, there's a lot of talk and people have been tasting things at GABF with cannabis and their non-alcoholic drinks with cannabis. I mean, I would say that we as a supplier, um, uh, you know, uh, in the non-alc space, for instance, or the spirit space, we think uh, those categories are coming together more and more. Uh, so I think there may be opportunities for growth for us in the non-alc space or the spirit space. You know, maybe you go and make a whiskey out of Lone Star. Right, that's the logical end for, for, for a beer. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, so so I think um, there are also in the in the non alcoholic beverage space there are a lot more now kind of more craft or artisanal suppliers making differentiated products. 
that also could use the kind of access to market that our distributor network and you know, supply chain capability provides. So I think we, you know, uh, uh, once we're ready uh, in terms of you know, our platform's capabilities, um, we certainly might look at something like that. Uh, Interesting. You know, non-alloc spirits. But uh, cannabis specifically is not an area where we've spent any time and effort. <laughs> um, uh, you know, we've got enough on our plate, I think, in the beer space right now. Interesting. So, so your partnership strategy could extend beyond craft and, and into some other segments. Yeah, why not? Well, I guess that, you know, when you talk about non-alc, it would really be, you know, do your wholesale partners, you know, want to even mess around with a product? Like well, I think, I think they do if, uh, you know, they built Red Bull, they built Monster, they yeah. got it taken away from them, right? So... I think uh, they would love to do, uh, whether it's energy drink or any other uh, kind of functional or premium or health beverage uh, categories, and they can do an amazing job doing that, but they want to feel like uh, it's the kind of relationship where, you know, tomorrow it's not going to be sold to Pepsi or Coke and disappear. Yeah, interesting. Um, well, uh, I guess my final question, why are you an underdog brewer? Well, I mean, look, we, we have a two-share. We're playing in uh, uh, kind of the near-premium segments. So in terms of our, uh, you know, revenue and profitability levels, we're smaller than Boston Beer, right? So we compare ourselves to the people, you know, we're competing with directly, which is, you know, AB and Miller Coors. Uh, so uh, AB now, after their deal, is about 300 times larger than we are. Uh, and, uh, and uh, I don't know, Molson Coors, I don't know, 40, 50 times. So... Uh, they're, they're at a diff, you know, they're a totally different scale, and you know we're trying to compete with them head to head. Uh, so we certainly see ourselves as as an underdog, but you know we think there are some things that uh, we can do better uh, and be more nimble as a supplier and focus on organic growth and forge uh, real partnerships uh, in the high end uh, and and really grow our business. Yeah, well, it's certainly going to be interesting to watch. Um, I'm. Really curious to see how the partnership strategy unfolds. And uh, now that I know that you got your eye on spirits and non-alc as well. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I said we got we to deal with beer right now. But, I'm, you know, if we're talking long term, it's certainly, uh, why not, right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what you guys do, and especially now with Simon at the helm. So um, after, get, after InBev buys Coke and Diageo, it won't be such a revolutionary <laughs> idea. <laughs> well, well, we'll have to have you back on stage at that time, I guess, right. and get your thoughts then. Eugene, thank you. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank you.